rheumatic brain injury and ICU management. Um, it should actually be split into two because the last time I gave it, it literally was an hour and 20 minutes. So, but, um, so I'll go fast, but please feel free to stop me at any time with any questions or if something's unclear. Um, and yeah, we'll try and see if we can get this going. All right. So, ooh, how do I, okay, I have to do that? Okay, so just a very quick overview. We'll very quickly look at the epidemiology of traumatic brain injuries, the pathology, and what the difference is between primary and secondary injury and why that's important to know. I'll do a little bit of a CT scan 101 with you guys. I'm just running through like a basic way to look at a CT scan in a systematic way. And we'll just discuss a few common trauma pathologies on CT scan. And then we'll get to kind of the meat bit of the, the talk, which is the management of these patients once they, once they get to us in ICU. Um, and we'll include how we select patients for monitoring. We'll look at a few waveforms and what they mean, uh, as well as run through some of the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines for the management of these patients. Um, so very quickly, I mean, epidemiology, um, it's a common thing in South Africa. It's a major cause of premature death um, with about 50% of all traumatic deaths second, being secondary to traumatic brain injury. And it's obviously a massive burden of morbidity as well with um, the majority of these patients needing a medium to long-term rehabilitation um, after they've survived their injury, if they survive. Numbers wise, we've got more or less about a thousand admissions to Kruderskjö Hospital every year. Um, and just on looking at the past couple of years admissions to D13 alone, we have on average about 200 patients a um, year just, just being admitted for severe traumatic brain injury. Um, so it's a loss and the costs drive up um, quite quickly. So traumatic brain injury, uh, you guys know that we get like a primary injury that happens at the time of impact or at the time of injury for these patients, which are uh, largely irreversible. Um, and you can classify them according to being focal or diffuse injuries. And then we get the secondary injuries, which is really where all of our efforts and attention go to try and prevent or at least effectively treat uh, any secondary injury which may happen. Um, and those include like intracerebral hematomas, which is always on a spectrum, uh, can be extradural, subdurals, intracerebral hematomas and contusions. And then as well as uh, cerebral ischemia, cerebral swelling and excitotoxicity, as well as herniation syndromes. And just remember, these are always like on a, a spectrum of disease. So you can have mild traumatic brain injuries and then obviously the very severe significant head injuries that take a lot of our time. Um, just a quick word on if you've heard the words diffuse brain injury versus diffuse axonal injury. Um, so diffuse brain injury is like a clinical term that we kind of apply to Im like imply that there's um, some signs um, suggestive of diffuse axonal injury. So diffuse axonal injury, you really can only use if you're a pathologist and you've taken some brain biopsies and you've seen um, how the axonal cell bodies get sheared from their ax axons. So that's when you actually say, that, that's when you can actually talk about diffuse axonal injury. Um, if not, and you, on a clinical basis, you call it diffuse brain injury, and it means usually there's subtle clinical markers on a CT scan that you can appreciate, which probably will indicate to you that this type of CT scan, if you, if you do manage to do a biopsy, this is more or less what you'll be seeing on, on biopsy. So there's usually like deep white matter, little gliding contusions, traumatic subarachnoid blood, cerebral swelling. Um, but because we can't call it diffuse axonal, we just kind of keep it at diffuse brain injury for clinical um, terms. So um, many, many processes that's involved in traumatic brain injury and um, secondary hit of that. Um, but the most important thing is that the... the uh, our, all our efforts should go into trying to intervene um, and prevent these secondary injuries or hits that the brain sustain um, in the post-injury period. Um, and that's where we really have the biggest impact to try and improve our patient incomes, uh, outcomes. Sorry. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> so CT scan. So just going through, this is literally just like a CT scan 101. Um, these are slides taken just from pictures of uh, that we've treated recently. This is more or less what a, a normal CT brain scan looks like. And just to kind of orientate yourselves, um, just to always remember that your left-hand side, as you're looking at a scan by convention, and this is internationally standardized, your left-hand side, as you look at a scan, is a patient's right side, and your right side is a patient's left side. And if you forget that ever, 
just imagine that you start standing by the foot end of a patient that's going into a scanner because that's how the slices are taken. Um, all right, so just starting at the first slide, okay, cursor up. So just um, looking at the first slice. So I've just tried to kind of depict the base of the brain for you guys to try and show you a little bit. Um, so just a few things on CT scan, maybe before I start sharing anatomy, is that CT scans are, um, we talk about densities uh, on CT scan and densities are measured in Hounsfield's units. Um, with um, very bright objects um, being on the positive spectrum of the Hounsfields uh, scale. I've got a picture of that as well. And then very hypodense or dark um, things on a CT scan is very hypodense and is towards the negative. So um, like pure water would appear darkish on a CT scan, but that would be a Hounsfield unit of zero where air would be minus 1,000 and dense calcified bone would be plus 1,000. So on that range or spectrum, you can then actually, you can actually measure on our PAC system the Hounsfield units of a specific area that you're interested in. And depending on the Hounsfield unit that you get, it can actually tell you whether or not you're looking at something that's likely to be fat, blood, infection or pus, um, bone or calcium, um, so you, it is actually useful and it is a setting that we can measure on, pass, uh, on packs the same way that we, we do other measurements as well. And I'm happy to show you guys when, when I get you guys on the round. So just orientation. So anterior up the nose of the patient will be on the upside, um, back of the head on the bottom side. And then as, as we've orientated left and right on left and right. So that's already the ears of the patient coming into view. And then the very hyperdense skull, um, you can appreciate as hyperdense, with, which will have a very high Hounsfield unit. Uh, and that's because of all the calcium deposits in the bone itself, which is also why acute blood on a CT scan is also hyperdense. It's because of the calcium that's in that blood. Um, so then looking at temporal tips or temporal lobes over here, um, and then cerebellar um, coming into view here, and the fourth ventricle with its nice little um, uh, sad face smile with midbrain that you can appreciate here. And in front of midbrain, you can start seeing the prepontine CSF cisterns. It's a nice place to look in a trauma scan to try and appreciate the amount of brain swelling that there is, look for signs of herniation, as well as traumatic subarachnoid blood you can also sometimes see um, in that area. Um, Coming a little bit higher um, now up uh, towards the, the uh, cerebrum. So you can start to appreciate the tent of the brain here coming up, still seeing the fourth ventricle nice and midline. It's a nice little subtle sign to look at as well. If you're looking for things like midline shift from herniation or bleeding or even post fossa subdurals and extradurals. Um, then the little star shape that you can appreciate here is part of the basal cisterns of um, subarachnoid space and it's nice and black which means it's nice normal CSF filling the space and this is also where you'll find the circle of Willis. So in patients that present with like ruptured aneur or aneurysmal subarachnoid blood that's usually, not always, usually a good place to look for sub subarachnoid blood from an aneurysm rupture because most of those aneurysms are in the anterior circulation, you'll see them there. Um, the other thing that you can appreciate here is the sylvian fissures. Um, you can start seeing them into view. Also a very nice place to look for signs of uh, cerebral swelling. Um, and then the air sinuses, also just a nice place to look. They should be black as filled with air. Sometimes in like situations like chronic sinusitis or even trauma where they have significant facial trauma, that will be filled with like what will appear like a grayish fluid filled with either blood or pus. Uh, in an infective or sinusitis type patient. All right, moving on to the third slice. Uh, what I wanted to show you here is just again to look at the sylvian fissures. They're both nice and patent here. Uh, you can appreciate the nice surface sulcal markings of the brain that's still patent. You also start to lose that in significant cerebral swelling. Uh, and then the ambient cisterns of CSF spaces that's at the back of the midbrain over here. And you still see just the tip uh, top bit of the cerebellum over here with the tent that kind of uh, is starting to show the last little bit of the tentorium cerebelli as it comes up um, covering the cerebellum. Uh, and then you can start to appreciate here the little CSF slot that's sitting there is the third ventricle. It's usually 
uh, a nice slit like ventricle should be in the midline as it is in this scan. Uh, and then coming up onto this slide, again, you can appreciate frontal lobes, parietal lobes, last little bits of the occipital um, lobes. Then the lateral ventricles are starting to come into view here. This is the frontal horns of the lateral ventricles. And what you can appreciate here is like they're nice and symmetrical. There's no midline shift that you can appreciate. And it's always nice to look at markers for, for a midline shift or mass effect on a CT scan. And then again here, you can appreciate and see that the third ventricle is nice and slit-like, again in the midline. Um, coming up a little bit higher, again, you can appreciate frontal um, horns of the lateral ventricles. You can also start to see the occipital horns um, of the lateral ventricles. Um, nice midline shape, nice surface sulcal markings. And what I also want you to note on this scan is you can see nice differentiation between what's gray matter and what's white matter. And remember on a scan, they flipped um, around the white matter is the darker gray bit and the darker and the lighter matter is actually the gray matter okay so um, but you can appreciate that that's been well retained you can see where white matter and gray matter kind of distinguishes and changes over and then the top but it's always important to go to the very top of a CT scan sometimes especially like with our patients that are assaulted with um, pungas and axis or things the depressed call fracture will be midline and right high and you might miss it if you don't come all the way up with the scan and the important bit is that the sagittal sinus runs in this middle groove here. And if you've got a sagittal sinus injury, then you know you need to watch that patient very clearly because they can um, develop significant venous infarct. And again here, you can appreciate the architecture of the brain very nicely um, with the surface sulcal markings that are still retained. So very happy to call this a normal CT scan. Um, and that's basically like how we go about looking at a CT scan in a trauma setting. The other thing that's usually a nice thing just to also look at is on the outside of the skull to look for um, soft tissue swelling. That'll also kind of give you the, an, an idea of the amount of force that's been um, applied to that, to that head. So just a few um, traumatic pathology scans to run through with you guys. Um, I will very quick, so I'm gonna go through this very, very quickly. Um, and then I go through these scans one by one um, as we go on a little bit, just to explain to you how these injuries actually occur and why the patterns of bleeding are, are as you see them on a scan. So the first scan is, um, is an, um, an example of contusions, so post-traumatic contusions, and you'll see them typically in the temporal and frontal uh, lobes, not, not exclusive, but especially in the high velocity acceleration, deceleration type injuries, you will appreciate frontal and temporal contusions and they can be quite massive. And we'll go through that in a little bit detail just now. Second scan is an example of an extradural hematoma, always lens shaped and almost always arterial in nature. So. These are patients that are usually also well until they're not. <laughs> and so these are the patients that had sustained an injury. They woke up, they're back up to a GCS of 14 or 15 out of 15. And then the next moment, as they stop to be able to um, accommodate for this rapidly expanding bleed, they will start to herniate and they die very quickly. Um, Second scan is an example of a chronic subdural hematoma. If you glance over that very quickly, like especially at the lower scan basis, I, I promise you that uh, these pathologies, the chronic subdurals get missed a lot, especially like the acutron chronic, um, because their density is very similar to the to brain matter. So you have to look at things like um, ventricles that will show you, but geez, I'm just look a little bit better. Uh, more closely at the scan because you can appreciate something is obviously causing that massive midline shift and if you look closely you'll see that the chronic subdural is sitting there. Sometimes it's not as obvious as this and you really need to look closely of why you, you've got mass effect on a scan. Second one is, is an example of an acute subdural hematoma. Um, the bottom one is an example of a subarachnoid. So now this is an aneurysmal subarachnoid hematoma. I just used the picture to kind of show to you um, the outline of the basal cistern. So all this acute blood sitting in the basal cistern CSF spaces, uh, and sometimes you can get it in traumatic subarachnoid blood, but in trauma, the subarachnoid blood tends to accumulate in the surface sulcal markings or gyri. So um, it looks a little bit different, but then instead of your CSF lying in your gyral spaces, you're gonna get acute blood. 
The, the next one is just an example of, this is again now a hypertensive intracerebral hematoma, but I just wanted to show you how a hematoma can actually break through the ependymal lining of the ventricles and actually fill the ventricles and cause obstructive hydrocephalus or entrapment hydrocephalus. Next one is an example of severe cerebral swelling. Um, so here you can appreciate that that prepontine and basal cistern CSF spaces are completely occluded. You can't see any CSF or blackness around that midbrain. You can't appreciate the foli of the cerebellum um, and all of that is completely lost and we'll go through a little bit of more detail. Last scan there at the bottom is an acute on chronic subdural hematoma. Now this can mean one of two things. You've either got a, an acute subdural hematoma that's been there for a little while, and as the calcium starts to denature in the blood, the blood starts to lose its hyperdensity and it actually, actually starts becoming isodense and then hypodense. The other thing that it can actually mean, so that's why you get this little meniscus level, but if you see an acute on chronic subdural hematoma, the other thing that could have happened is that you had a small little chronic subdural hematoma, especially in the elderly patient, and they've had a second hit or knock or something to their head, and now they've got a rebleed. Um, so that's also something just to always kind of keep in mind. So just going through the pathophysiology of these um, uh, uh, injuries. So contusions, I told you, like especially with the uh, acceleration, deceleration, high velocity injuries. If you look at the inside of the skull, the anterior cranial fossa, which is this bit where the frontal lobes lie on, and the middle cranial fossa, where the temporal lobes are mainly situations, they're very rough surfaces. And if you can imagine that you've got this brain shifting backwards and forwards on this very rough surface, you can start to imagine why you get contusions mainly um, located in the temporal and the frontal. It's not to say that you won't see contusions in the parietal and occipital lobes, you do. It's just that with the high velocity injuries, we tend to more see them in the temporal and the frontal um, areas. So the extradural hematoma, just to, I've already kind of alluded to you guys that the extradural hematoma mostly uh, is arterial in nature and most of them come from the middle meningeal artery as it comes through for Raymond Spinoza and here at the base of the brain. The extradural hematoma is lens shaped because it's, it's um, limited by the cranial vault sutures. So the dura is actually attached at all these suture lines. There's dural attachment. So the extradural hematoma here at the coronal and at the lambdoid suture can only actually expand as, as far or as anterior and as posterior as the dural attachments will allow it before it will start to actually move inwards towards the brain, which then gives it this lens-shaped appearance. Just a side note on the extradural hematoma, you may come across an extradural hematoma like this one, but not as clear, that has a little bit of hypodensity in this extradural. And now you're going to say, well, Christelle said, you know, if there's hypodensity, then the blood is starting to denature and it's becoming chronic. It's not true in an extradural hematoma. When you see like, especially you get these little whorls sometimes in an extradural of hypodense or dark spots, that's actually a sign of a hyperacute blood. And that's, that's ongoing active bleeding from the middle meningeal artery at the time that the scan was actually taken. So you need to treat these patients with like great urgency. Um, so acute subdural hematomas, they are different in the uh, pathophysiology in terms of most of the bleeds of acute subdural hematomas come from quite high, um, also again, in young patients, the trauma patients, um, they come also from high velocity, high energy injuries where you've got acceleration and deceleration. And what happens is you've got these surface um, uh, cortical veins that as they lie on the surface of the brain they will cross the subdural space to drain in the arachnoid villi um, to, to, to help with the venous drainage of the cortical surfaces of the brain. When you have that rapid and significant acceleration deceleration you can actually tear these bridging veins in the subdural space and you get uh, the subdural space is obviously a lot more forgiving as well in terms of creating space than the extradural space. And you can get quite significant, massive subdural hematomas as well. The acute subdural hematomas are not uh, are a worse prognosticator compared to an extradural hematoma. 
because the acute subdural hematomas usually also imply that there's some form of diffuse brain injury that's gone with that, just because of the, the actual physics to shake that brain so significantly, like anterior and posteriorly, that the bridging veins tear in a, in a young, healthy, normal brain, that it usually means that that young trauma patient will have some sort of neurological sequelae from the diffuse brain injury aspect as well, which you may not be able to appreciate on the initial scan. Whereas the extradural hematoma patient usually has a fracture that tears the middle meningeal artery and they have no underlying brain injury itself. Um, in the older patients, it's a, it's a very different scenario. Because the older patients, as you age, you have some cerebral atrophy. And you can imagine then that this subdural space actually starts to enlarge uh, in elderly patients. And usually the patients that we see that come to us are also patients that have chronic AF and they've been on warfarin yeah. and they forgot to follow up their INRs or what the story may ever be. And they actually, they just need a small knock to the head and they will also get quite significant subdural hematomas. Um, so I've mentioned, so this is just a, an image or an example of the Hounsfield unit scales um, uh, that you can actually measure. And I'd like to show you guys this when we are on around maybe. Uh, oh, wow. Okay. So our... Time limit has been removed. Oh, okay, maybe I can speak a little bit slow. Okay, so, and I'll show you maybe on the rounds itself how you can just measure Hounsfield's units of a specific area. It's a little circle that you draw actually in an area. So you can't actually measure everything on the brain all at once. You need to actually target a little area and you can measure the Hounsfield's units and then you can say, well, I think this is fat. No, I actually think this is air or CSF or whatever the case may be. And you can actually... Um, uh, refine your differential diagnosis uh, that way. Uh, ooh, now I've lost the bit. Ah, okay, there we go. Uh, and just maybe to give you like a visual representation of the acute on chronic subdural hematoma, the little um, meniscus effect. So you, you guys have all seen like drawn blood before, and if you actually let it stand, you can sediment it out. And this is more or less what happens in a chronic subdural hematoma that hasn't actually had an, a rebleed. Um, you can actually start separating out the blood that starts to denature and loses its hyperdensity that's contributed by the, uh, the calcium. Okay, subarachnoid blood. Again, just to remind yourself, the reason why we see it in the basal systems of the CSF is because that's exactly where the circle of Willis sits. So you'll start to see it um, in the prepontine um, uh, cisterns and even all the way back. So this one shows nicely at the... Um, uh, ambient cisterns at the back of the midbrain and it even tracks towards the sylvian fissures on both sides as well and i mean i've just put this picture here so that you can kind of um, visualize how the middle meningeal or ach, the middle cerebral arteries run on the side here as well okay so intracerebral hematomas and intraventricular hemorrhage are tricky if you don't actually have a history for a patient because Traumatic intracerebral hematomas look very different to spontaneous um, intracerebral hematomas from uncontrolled hypertension, looks very different to hemorrhages from um, malignant or metastatic lesions in the brain. So I just wanted to show you a couple of examples. So this is a massive um, uh, intracerebral hematoma from uh, an uncontrolled hypertensive patient that has actually broken into the uh, ventricular system through the ependym, uh, ependymal lining and it's actually causing entrapment hydrocephalus of the ventricles. Um, this one is again another example um, of a, a hypertensive bleed which is in a typical location, uh, deep, uh, deep white matter of the brain. Um, but this one I want to show you. So this one is a lot more superficial um, in its location, more in the um, frontoparietal area. And if I had to hazard a guess, um, on this one, like this is not a uh, this is not a patient that I know, so I don't have any history. But if I had to give like a differential diagnosis, one of my concerns would that would be that this is a, a met that's bled. Also, a little bit of underlying um, cerebral edema around that, um, which again also makes me think of maybe this is actually a metastatic lesion that's bled. Um, so some examples of cerebral swelling. Um, so I've just kind of put this picture here for you just to kind of have a reference point that when you look at these slices, all the things that you've lost in terms of um, ventricular um, morphology, the surface sulcal and gyral markings, the midline, the ambient cisterns, 
the basal cisterns. Um, uh, yeah. So over here, this is the slide that I had on that initial scan. So you've lost the prepontine cisterns, basal cisterns. You can't appreciate any sylvian fissures that should start creeping up here. And also on this one, um, you can also appreciate that you've lost your gray-white matter distinction completely. Um, and also to remember that cerebral swelling can be a focal thing and can be a global thing. Um, and it can also... Um, also on a spectrum of uh, severity. So you can have very mild cerebral swelling uh, like this scan over here. So you've just got a little bit of almost like fattening um, of the gyri of the frontal and the parietal lobe with a little bit of loss of your gray white matter distinction. Um, whereas the bottom scan here is a severely swollen brain with loss of gray white matter. You, can, you can't even appreciate the ventricular system. Um, so it's been com all the CSF has been completely squished out by the, the severe swelling. Um, and uh, this patient is, uh, I would hazard a guess, is probably brain dead. You can also, what you can appreciate here is something that they call like the white cerebellum sign. And it's just the way that the blood supply from the anterior and the posterior circulation for the circle of Willis um, Often, uh, if you've got complete knockout of your anterior circulation with no communication from your posterior communicating arteries, then you'll have, um, then you may have a sparing of your cerebellum. So it's called a white cerebellum because then if you compare it to the cerebral hemispheres, the cerebral hemispheres will appear very dark and the cerebellum will be kind of spared in a way. Um, and so it's called the, the white cerebellum sign. Okay, so a little bit more on uh, secondary injury. So there's just a few things that then I'll touch on as uh, that I may not have mentioned when we were talking about it. So just remember, um, with extradural hematomas, just always remember the pressure volume curve that these patients sit on. Because these patients will reach, they will compensate and compensate. And obviously, the more chronic the injury, so like a chronic subdural hematoma patient will have more time to compensate and shunt CSF out of their system and actually shift um, brain matter across to the opposite side over a slower time period. So their symptoms initially may be a lot su more subtle than a patient with an extradural hematoma that the hematoma is expanding so rapidly that um, they show signs a lot earlier. But just remember with an extradural hematoma patient, they can be piping along on their pressure volume curve. Up until this point, they may be GCS 15 out of 15 and all of a sudden, they can't compensate anymore for that, for that expanding volume and they actually can herniate and die very quickly from being GCS 15 out of 15 to 15 minutes later being three out of 15 with fixed and dilated pupils. So these are really the patients because they also have um, potentially such a good prognosis. I mean, if you get these patients into theater immediately, do a good craniotomy and evacuate, these patients can potentially even go home the next day. So these are the patients we really do try and fight for very hard. Um, the acute subdural hematoma, I just wanted to show you another like real life of the crossing or bridging veins into the um, subdural, from the subdural space into the arachnoid villi. And I've already told you that um, many of these patients are associated with diffuse axonal injury or diffuse brain injury. Um, and it's mainly a venous bleeding. And now you can actually appreciate nice the cortical veins on the surface here. Um, uh, cerebral ischemia, okay, I think we dealt with that quite nicely. Um, and just to kind of remember that everything we try and do in, in ICU is to try and limit um, that secondary injury. So we try and maintain good cerebral perfusion pressures to ensure good brain oxygenation, tissue oxygen delivery, um, so that the cells don't actually, these cells that are trying to recover don't actually get a second hit um, and develop further hypoxia or ischemia. Um, okay, so this pathophysiology of secondary brain injury is a whole nother lecture on its own um, and is, is very complex and there's many, many mechanisms um, involved in it. Um, and maybe that's something we can also look at. Ugh, I, don't, I don't know, though, if you guys need to know it for your intermediate exams. It is quite complex and we kind of only really need to know it for the neurosurgery final exams. Um, so again, some mechanisms um, by which the secondary injury happens in, in brain injury. So there's a lot of oxidative stress that happens, disruption of the blood-brain barrier that um, contributes to the hypoxia and the ischemia. 
um, a lot of inflammatory processes that get set off, um, and that all also contributes to extra excitotoxicity and cell death, but both programmed and um, direct. Um, just also another nice just visualization for you guys about cerebral um, swelling. So here you can appreciate like actually the um, pathological like actual pictures of what a swollen brain looks like if you can um, compare it to what a normal brain surface sulcal and gyral markings look like and just look at the um, how bad it actually can get. Um, just some slides uh, for to show you that actually the cerebral swelling and cerebral edema can actually it's not only uh, uh, intracellular but it's also extracellular swelling um, so it's not only the cells that have extra water and swell up it's also the intracellular um, water that increases and causes swelling um, so management of TBI um, is obviously very important and that's why we, 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 we do what we do and we try and um, minimize that secondary uh, injury that the brain um, may or may not sustain. So just going to run through very quickly, just a few points that I do want to touch on on history. I mean, none of you guys are in medical school anymore. So, I mean, we, we're talking on reg, at reg level at least. But there's just a few things on the history and the examination that I just want to make clear that, I, that I've noticed a lot of people either struggle with or there's some misunderstanding. And then we can talk about how we investigate these patients, which you should all be familiar with already, and then the treatment of it itself. And just, I can't reiterate this enough, is that our main aim is to prevent the secondary brain injury. Okay, so on examination, just one thing that I want to tell you guys on the GCS and then some um, pointers on herniation syndromes. Um, so on the GCS, the only thing that I wanted to just get some, or give some clarity for you guys is on the motor score. So the, the GCS, people always like, tend to ask on a ward round, but now what's the difference between a motor score of M3 and M4? And I mean, for, for us as neurosurgeons, there's a, there is a big difference between a patient that's an M3 and an M4, because the level of injury at the brain actually changes the prognosis for the patient significantly. I mean, it's very rare that we would take a patient after resuscitation that still sits with the best score of a motor three, uh, whereas we, we're fairly happy to take a patient with an M4 level. And that's just because of the level of injury in the brain itself. Um, so you guys would know that M2 and M3 previously was referred to as decerebrate and decorticate. We don't refer to it like that anymore. And we just um, talk about abnormal flexion, abnormal extension. Um, so that I think everybody is quite comfortable with the M2. And I've left my video on specifically just to demonstrate this bit for you guys. Um, so the M2, most people are very comfortable with that at a painful stimulus um, is applied. The patient has this very hypertonic, spastic almost extension of the limbs. There might be an initial um, small flexion before the patient starts to extend, but then you'll see that it, it ha the, the patient has this very spastic look to his movements or her movement um, of either the upper or lower limbs. Whereas the abnormal flexion is also, so the big difference between distinguishing the, M2, uh, the M3 from the M4 is in the tone of which the patient actually um, shows or elicits the, the flexion behavior. Where a normal M4, um, you can almost equate it or think that, you know, that this patient might actually even be localizing, but they're just too weak. Their flexion um, isn't so good as to, you know, them being, being able to grab your hand on their sternum or come above the clavicle to reach for your hand if you're doing a supra um, ocular pain stimulus. Um, so, but it's a, it's a normal flexion. It has a normal movement, a normal almost tone to it. Whereas the M3 flexion is, again, a very abnormal, spastic type flexing behavior. And you'll see some, uh, one of the signs that you can look for, it's not always present, is that the patients actually turn their, their thumbs in and they, their hand becomes very stiff and spastic and they start to flex. It is definitely a flexing movement, but the whole tone of it is abnormal. And, and that's when you can, you know, quite certainly say that the patient's definitely still an M3 and not an M4. And usually the prognosis with that is, is a lot worse. 
Um, just on a side note, I will make these notes available to you guys through Ingrid. Um, it is unfortunately in a PDF form because the PowerPoint itself is very large. So it's not easy to actually disseminate or, or, or send through email. Um, just then one word on the herniation syndromes. There's a lot of nice pictures and descriptions on herniation syndromes um, and how you can clinically actually pick it up. I must say practically and pragmatically, like in the clinical setting, it's not always something that you go and look for. Like, I mean, by the time your patient elicits herniation syndromes, you've kind of missed the boat and you need to act very quickly. So you can't actually sit and think, oh, well, is this now transclival? Is it transtentorial? Is it tonsillar herniation? Try and put all the signs together and figure out where it's coming from. You need to be able to recognize it very quickly when you see it and you need to act on it very quickly if you are going to actually have any hope in, in saving this patient and giving him the best prognosis for, for survival. Okay. Um, uh, just another picture to kind of help you guys remember that uh, one of the um, herniation syndromes that we, we often hear and we get a little bit nervous about. So the sub sign herniation just means that, you know, the cerebrum is kind of dipped. So you often see it with massive subdural hematomas that the, the affected hemisphere actually gets pushed towards the opposite hemisphere and it dips below the sub sign herniation. This is not a non-survivable herniation, but it, it may lead to significant either transient or even permanent neurological deficit, but this is not something that's somewhat going to kill you. The ones that are very dangerous is the uncle herniations. So that's the medial um, edge of the temporal lobe that dips down the tent that sits over the cerebellum it dips down and it dips towards the midbrain, which is the problem. It causes midbrain compression. And if that goes untreated, you will also eventually cause um, transforaminal herniation of, of either the midbrain and or cerebellum with it. And that's usually a, a non-survivable in, uh, injury if you can't actually reverse it or sort out the cerebral swelling or the uh, mass lesion that's causing it very quickly. Um, just a pathology slide to kind of show you how significant the uncle herniation can actually be. That taint actually then also kind of cuts into, cuts into that temporal lobe and actually that bit of the temporal lobe now ended up be below the cerebellum, uh, the, the taint. Okay, uh, one of the things that you will notice when these herniations occur or severe significant spike in intracranial pressure is a Cushing's reflex. Um, very, uh, everybody kind of knows it and recognizes it when they see it. And it's this triad um, that happens when there's increased intracranial pressure where you can see hypertension with a bradycardia and abnormal breathing pattern, which you may or may not see depending on if your patient is very deeply um, sedated and paralyzed on a ventilator. So the respiratory um, breathing efforts may be missed. Um, Right, so investigations that we routinely do, we do do lab tests, so we often send off an ABG, we look at the PCO2 level, that it's not too high as to cause cerebral vasodilation. Uh, we also look at the HB on that, and obviously also the glucose is very useful. Um, and then the PO2 as well, we want our brains well oxygenated and make sure that we at least have good oxygen delivery to the brain. Uh, we do a full blood count, a UNE, a group and screen, especially if we're going to take a patient to theatre um, in anticipation if we need to actually maybe transfuse the patient. And then INR and TIG studies we preserve for the patients that are either known with bleeding uh, abnormalities or like I've I mentioned before, like the elderly patients with chronic subdural hematomas that are known to be on warfarin or aspirin or clopidogrel or whatever uh, anticoagulants they may be on. Um, imaging, typically our patients that come to Crotoscure all get a Lodox scan. Um, you can also, the Lodox also gives, um, over the years, the C-spine imaging on, on the Lodox has also improved a lot. So you get usually a good uh, PA view and a lateral view um, on, the, on the Lodox for C-spine, which is a good screening, um, a, a screening x-ray. Uh, skull x-rays have kind of fallen out of <laughs> um, fashion just because we've got very easy access to CT scans here 24 hours of the day. Um, so skull x-rays are kind of uh, not, not necessary anymore. MRIs in the trauma setting, we kind of uh, tend to reserve for patients with acute spinal cord injuries with worsening neurology. Um, that's when we'll, we'll try and get an urgent uh, trauma MRI scan. 
um, CT scan indications ugh, with us, almost any patient that's had some sort of a history of a head injury um, gets scanned these days, but there are actually guidelines, Canadian uh, CT scan rules, and we've even got our own Western Cape um, head injury guidelines um, where any patient with uh, GCS of less than 15 out of 15, any penetrating skull injury, any patient with focal neurological um, fallout, if there's a patient that has CSF leak, um, if the patient has persisting, persisting symptoms, especially headaches after a head injury, or a patient that presents with seizures after a head injury, will all get uh, all indications to get a CT scan. Okay, monitoring of TBI patients, believe it or not, we've also got guidelines to help us um, uh, sift through which patients are the appropriate patients to take for intracranial pressure monitors. At Crudiscure, the majority of trauma patients will get an intracranial pressure monitor as well as a Lycox monitor, which is the brain tissue oxygenation monitor. Uh, and we insert it via a bolt system. Um, so it's something similar to this. Um, and again, the, in the indications for uh, ICP monitoring is a little bit dependent on the um, managing clinician um, or even like the admitting um, doctor in like neurocritical care unit, which, which in our unit most of the time is prosample. Um, but also then the on-call neurosurgeon or neurosurgical consultant will make a call whether or not a patient will need um, intracranial pressure monitoring. And often it's reserved for the patients with severe head injury, um, where you know to kind of prevent or limit their secondary brain injury, you'll have to keep them very sedated, flat, uh, and to then kind of monitor, monitor them on clinical grounds becomes almost nearly impossible. Um, so then we'll insert the monitors. The monitors themselves, um, now when I used to give this talk in real life, I've got some examples of what the monitors look like, but when they arrive uh, with you in ICU, you'll see this little antenna sticking out the head. Um, the bolt itself actually gets drilled into the skull uh, and it gets tightened into the skull itself. And then through the bolt mechanism goes the ICP monitor, which we just aim to have in a subdural space. They Both monitors sit in the brain itself, in the brain matter. The ICP monitor sits about a centimeter subdurally in the brain matter. Whereas the Lycox, we try and aim to get into the white matter. So that usually sits at about two and a half centimeters within the brain to get um, good, stable oxygenation readings um, of the brain. Uh, we do also do try and elect for uh, like a non-injured uh, side of the brain because it also doesn't really help if you put the monitors in a contusion itself because you don't really then know how to interpret your Lycox reading if you've got very high um, readings on the brain oxygenation. I do apologize. I see some sort of PowerPoint devil has switched my two labels around, but this is actually the box of the Lycox, which goes with this label, which is the brain oxygenation um, tissue tension. Uh, and this is the ICP Lycox box. Um, you guys would have seen them in the units if you've uh, rotated through the surgical, the trauma ICU. Um, so uh, we would routinely then put both these monitors in for this patients and it always goes with an A-line so that we can always work out cerebral perfusion pressure. Um, so once you have a mean arterial pressure and you've got an ICP reading, you can work out cerebral perfusion pressure um, if you just subtract the, mean uh, the ICP from the mean arterial pressure. A CVP is all, always a nice thing also that we, we have in all of our patients that can be monitored. And that's just because we don't, we don't only use it for prolonged propofol infusions, which these patients may need for anything from three to seven to even 10 days. Um, as part of their um, ICP management protocol, but also it's nice to use when we have to use things like mannitol or hypertonic saline to give it through a big, um, uh, into a big central vein uh, is always very nice. Um, then just a word on autoregulation. Um, you guys would have also on the ward round um, been made aware of, you know, whether or not the patient's autoregulation is intact and how it works and, and why it's so important. So, I mean, obviously the brain um, uh, vasculature is, uh, is very, well, not unique, but um, also has uh, a quite exquisite ability to uh, regulate the cerebral um, blood flow um, just depending on blood pressure and resistance and CO2 levels, as well as viscosity of the blood itself. Um, 
and within a, a certain range of blood pressure, the cerebral vasculature can actually constrict and relax to maintain a constant cerebral blood flow um, to ensure adequate brain oxygen delivery to the brain. Whereas outside of those ranges, the, the, so usually a blood pressure of less than 50 or greater than 150, the cerebral blood uh, vasculature actually uses a little bit of that ab ability to um, control and maintain the cerebral blood flow that tightly. The problem is that this, is, this little graph depicts what happens in normal people, you and me. We have this ability to maintain a constant cerebral blood flow no matter what happens to our blood pressure so if we lie down if we stand up if we sit all those things all those little subtle changes our brain can't kind of accommodate for and in some um, patients with traumatic brain injuries they maintain this ability to some degree but you can sometimes appreciate patients that um, have significant severe global brain injury they've lost this ability completely so, and you'll see it um, uh, as, as an example in patients that um, when they start becoming hypotensive for, let's say, a secondary septic shock or um, hypovolemia that you're still trying to figure out where it's coming from and you have to start them on adrenaline, um, that as you start them with adrenal uh, on the adrenaline and you actually manage to push out the blood pressure, that you'll see that the ICP will climb with it. And as you back down on the adrenaline, um, and the blood pressure starts coming down again, the ICP drops as well. So the, the ICP is in a large way then driven by the blood pressure, which is a sign of, you know, complete low, total loss of autoregulation in, in that patient. Um, and there are a few patients we've had recently that we've had this, the gentleman in the 20 ICU, he had a similar, similar type ICP picture. Um, this is just an, another graph um, to try and uh, explain that. And just to know that autoregulation is not just blood pressure driven. It, it can also be driven by um, metabolic signal, um, mainly and most, most sensitive to PCO2. Um, that can also drive it, which is why hyperventilating a patient doesn't work for um, very long. It works very well, but only for a few minutes. But knowing that as you drop the CO2 and you cause severe vasoconstriction, you, you're also going to compromise um, cerebral oxygen delivery when you do that. It, all, it is also um, dependent on blood viscosity, but to a lesser level. Um, and then as we've now um, discussed, blood pressure uh, in itself uh, is, uh, is a big driver of cerebral autoregulation. Um, then just one or two words. I've, I go into a lot of details for the anaesthetists before their, their part two exams um, because they do get asked a lot on ICP waveforms and I suppose the neurosurgery guides before their intermediates and finals as well. Uh, you need to kind of be able to explain these waveforms. But just to kind of give a very basic overview. So, I mean, you've got this little antenna that comes out of the, the bolt system. It's connected to a transducer. Um, and then it also gives you this waveform pattern, very much like the waveform pattern that you see on an A-line um, that you can appreciate. And depending on the morphology of the waveform itself, you can actually, it'll give you some clues as to what's happening with the brain compliance um, uh, dealing with the raised ICP. So these are a few examples of it. So this is a normal uh, waveform, and this is not an A-line. This is an ICP waveform, but like I said, it, it looks very similar to an A-line trace form. Uh, you've got typically in a normal ICP waveform, you've got three waves um, that you can appreciate. The first one's called a P1 or an arterial pulsation or percussion wave. The second one is a P2 or a brain compliance, also often referred to as a tidal wave. And then the third little wave is again also um, associated, it's called the P3 or the aortic valve closure or diprotic wave. Um, so, and that's normally what they look like, a nice step down um, little waveform. The different types of waveforms that you can get, um, I'm gonna start with the blue one on this side, is you can, can sometimes in patients with isolated high systolic blood pressures, you get this massive P1 peak wave or percussion wave, and then a normal P2 and a P3. And this is just a patient with uncontrolled hypertension um, that has a high blood pressure. It doesn't really mean anything. You don't need to really act on it. Um, 
and then uh, oppositely, like the, the pink waveform here is somebody that's hypotensive, very low systolic blood pressure, and the P1 and the P2 wave are almost at the same level. Uh, and that's just a hypotensive patient that you can sometimes appreciate these waveforms. Um, a patient, so in trauma settings, these two waveforms, if you've got a patient with raised intracranial pressure, you can sometimes see this on the ICP monitors in the ICUs, with a patient with normal ICP ranges, it's not something that you need to look at. But in a patient with raised ICP, where the P2 starts to peak higher than the P1, it is often an indication that your brain is starting to lose compliance and ability to kind of compensate for this raised ICP. And then when the, I always, I always think of this ICP waveform as like, a, it starts looking like a tombstone. Uh, and that's usually because it leads to that. Um, but this is a critically raised ICP where you've almost lost definition between your P1, your P2, and your P3 waves. Um, uh, and this is a patient that you, if you don't intervene on urgently, they're probably going to herniate mm -hmm. and die. Um, so some clinical examples. So these photos are all taken from our units. Um, so what I've, what I've done here is the picture on the top is the green box, which is the ICP. And you can see that it's, he's, this patient's got a raised ICP of 29. And here you can also, um, I've tried to take these pictures as best as I can, but you can see that the P1 wave is lower than the P2 wave and the Lycox have started to drift down. So this is a patient that's probably um, heading towards some trouble if you don't actually start intervening um, and, and treating this raised ICP to try and improve on the brain oxygenation. Um, this is a clinical example of a patient with hyperemia. Now, unfortunately, I didn't have a picture of where these monitors are placed, but assuming that these monitors are well placed and they're not in a contusion, um, this is an example of what happens in hyperemic um, brain injury. And it's usually a vascular driven thing. And this ICP that you see here, which is also raised, is mainly driven by, by vascular changes which um, is often part of the spectrum of uh, brain recovery, um, how the blood flow changes um, whilst the brain starts to recover. Um, it doesn't always mean that. It also can just mean that you've also now lost autoregulation completely um, and the, um, the cerebral vasculature is starting to dilate, which is also why you're seeing this hyperemia. And that, this in itself, that, that vascular dilatation, um, which is often not sensitive to CO2 changes. So you may want to try and interfere with it by fiddling with the CO2. It often doesn't actually respond to CO2 changes. Um, and that's what's driving this, this raised ICP level. Um, just to kind of also let you know, sometimes we put in IC, we, uh, we put in external ventricular drains. We don't do it often for trauma cases, just because from a technical aspect, if you've got a patient with a significant head injury, um, the brain is often very swollen. And on pictures that I've shown you before, the ventricular sizes are actually very small. And to try and get an external ventricular drain in the right place where you can actually use it becomes very difficult. Um, so that's why we often don't put external ventricular drains and it's just because we can't. Um, but if you do manage to get an external ventricular drain, they're great because then you've got another way to treat raised ICP by letting off CSF. And you can also doubles up and you can use it just like a CVP. You can hook it up to the patient's monitor. And this is actually an ICP waveform. And you can actually monitor it on the patient's monitor itself. And you don't actually need a, an extra, you know, 14,000 rand ICP monitor that you have to hook up onto a, a monitor. Um, so this is just an example then of what it starts to look like when you've got uncontrolled ICP with, uh, with raised pressures and you've completely, this patient's uh, brain is completely ischemic. Um, the temperature also starts to drop. Uh, it's not faulty. It's just, it's just telling you that the cerebral blood flow is deteriorated and decreased to such a uh, level that the brain is actually starting to cool down. Um, this is just an example of one of our patients that we had in D13 ICU that I just wanted to kind of demonstrate to you this loss of autoregulation. So all the things that are up here is obviously patient monitor. What I want you to look at here is the mean arterial pressure. This is adrenaline running like I think quadruple strength at 30 mils an hour to keep this blood pressure looking like this. Here you've got an ICP and there you've got a Lycox. So here you can see the ICP is 72. And now you have to take my word, I didn't take a video. But as you actually try and come down on the adrenaline, 
the, the mean arterial pressure starts to fall and the ICP actually follows it. So this is uh, an ICP that's completely driven by the, by the blood pressure and this patient's completely lost all autoregulation ability. And then obviously with pressures like that, you get no cerebral blood flow and your life ops is zero. Uh, Lundberg waveforms, you guys don't have to know. The slide is actually left in after the last anesthetic talk that I had to give. This is one of the questions that they get asked sometimes um, just to explain Lundberg waveforms. But just to know, it's kind of trends in ICPs um, and also the different types of patterns that you get with raised intracranial pressure can also tell you different um, things, but it's not important for you guys to know. And if there is anybody that really wants to know it, I'm happy to explain it to you guys. Um, and this was just a, an example of a Lundberg C wave, which doesn't mean anything. And it's usually associated with cardiac cycle uh, cycling. Okay, so now um, just to run over some treatment of traumatic brain injury, the actual stuff that we do in ICU when we look after these patients. Um, so these brain trauma foundation guidelines that I'll go through with you guys, um, there's very much a tiered approach that we use um, to, to manage these patients. There's some physical maneuvers that you can do for these patients. There's medical treatments or therapies that we can institute for these patients. And then there's obviously also some surgical options that we have available to treat these patients. This is not a picture that I've taken. This is not any of our patients. Um, so this picture is actually just taken from the website, this website down here um, uh, online. But uh, I thought this picture is quite nice just to kind of demonstrate all the physical things that we can uh, institute to treat these patients. So physical maneuvers often have quite significant um, impact uh, when you have a patient with a raised ICP and you get called in the middle of the night by the sister looking after the patient and you get there, there's a couple of things that you actually just need to check before you actually start running in hypertonic saline and hyperventilating the patient and calling the neurosurgeon to come and do an urgent decompressive craniotomy. Um, so there's a few things just important to checks to make sure so simple things make sure that the patient's head is elevated 30 to 40 degrees often you'll see if the patients are busy um, the sisters are busy nursing and cleaning and turning these patients they get light flat and you just stand there for a few minutes and you'll see the icps climb from 10 to 20 to 25 to 30 to 40 and that's just purely positional um, and if you raise that patient head up again at 30 to 40 degrees, uh, you kind of just improve their venous drainage, um, their ICPs will settle quite nicely. To make sure that the head is nice and straight in midline, and that's just also to ensure good venous drainage, that you don't occlude one of the jugular veins, um, draining from the brain and often just turning their head straight improves that venous drainage enough to control the ICP that you don't actually have to um, intervene any further. If the patients have neck collars on, just to make sure that, I mean, most of these patients that come in that have ICP monitors, they're sedated, they're running propofol at 20 mils an hour. So you don't need to have that Philadelphia or neck collar on so tight that you kind of constrict again their venous drainage from their brain. So just make sure that the, the collar, that you can get your fingers easily in the side of the, the collar and that there isn't any obstruction from venous outflow. And then also the other um, culprit sometimes is the tracky tape that keeps the ET tube in place. Just to also make sure that behind the ear, sometimes it slips down and it's so tight here that it's actually occluding the, the jugular venous drainage um, from the brain. And if you just loosen that up and you improve that, you'll also see the ICP settle nicely. Okay, so Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines, we very much um, follow these guidelines. They're international guidelines um, that get, um, we're currently in our fourth edition, which was published in 2016. They get updated every about four to five years. So we're, we're due for a, for a new guideline now about, but I think with the whole COVID story happening that um, we'll probably have some delayed um, guidelines published from, from the BTF Foundation. Um, but they're essentially, like most other guidelines, um, there are consensus um, guidelines uh, to follow. Um, the only level one or class one evidence um, in this whole guideline is, uh, is on steroids, and we'll go through that. Um, but then we'll just run through. These are essentially the two pages of the guidelines that we'll just go through. Um, so in terms of decompressive craniectomies, um, 
they they do work in terms of controlling ICPs, but it has been shown that they don't actually improve overall outcome for patients, um, but they do shorten ICU stay, um, and then you also often need to use less ICP targeting interventions like hypertonic saline, mannitol, all those other fancy things. So if you can get a decompressive craniectomy done early, they do work but they unfortunately don't um, alter outcome for these patients. And all you do is, so when I mean outcome, is you'll increase your survival uh, rate for these patients, but um, independent uh, functioning patients, you, you actually, the, the group of patients that you improve mortality outcome on are patients that end up um, either in a, a permanent vegetative state or patients with very bad uh, Glasgow outcome scales, and they can't actually go back to independent living. Um, a word on prophylactic hypothermia, it doesn't improve uh, outcomes. Um, if you institute it early, there may be some benefit, but the, the research thus far has been that they don't, they don't actually improve outcome, mortality outcomes. Osmotherapy, so as I've mentioned, these guidelines were published in 2016, so mannitol is still the number one um, uh, osmotherapeutic agent that the BTF guidelines will promote. My suspicion is that in the new Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines is that that may actually swing towards hypertonic saline, depending on the setting that you're at. Um, it's not really good for um, you know, uh, the peripheral hospitals that don't have access to infusion pumps and things. Um, but if you're actually in an ICU setting, hypertonic saline works better than mannitol um, uh, to control ICP. And I, I suspect that it will change in the, in the new BTF guidelines. There are, there's enough evidence that's come out where hypertonic saline and mannitol has been put head to head. And it seems like hypertonic saline um, seems to have the better outcomes if you compare it with mannitol. Then in terms of draining CSF, so I've mentioned if you manage to get an external ventricular drain in a trauma patient, kudos to you. But also then um, the debate comes, well, should I actually leave this EVD open the whole time and set it at a certain height? Or should I just actually let off CSF as the ICPs go up and just kind of use it that way to relieve CSF intermittently? And the, uh, the guidelines actually state that continuous drainage is better than intermittent. So what you then do is you set your um, external ventricular drain at a certain height uh, at 15 or 20 centimeters. And if the pressures then go higher than that, then the CSF will automatically drain rather than just leaving the EVD clamped and letting CSF off when you actually notice that the, the ICPs are going up. Ventilation. So uh, I think we're, we all know now that hyperventilating the head injury patients are bad. Um, uh, and uh, it actually just causes vasoconstriction. It will bring down the ICP, but you just have to remember that you, you're doing it by mechanism of causing, especially. Uh, uh, ischemia to the brain because you're causing such bad and severe vasoconstriction you're actually halting cerebral blood flow it's not that you're decreasing the swelling you're actually improving the icp by stopping the blood flow to the brain or at least to deter like dropping it a lot so you're actually just um you're exchanging one injury for another um it will save you so where we use it as, as neurosurgeons is if we've got a patient that we need to rush to theater and we you know, start seeing a Cushing's reflex or a critically raised ICP and we're trying to buy time to get into theater, we will um, often then sacrifice those few minutes to hyperventilate a patient to try and see if we can't just prevent that patient from herniating. That's really the only place that it's, it's good for. Um, sedation, so propofol is still the recommended um, sedation agent for routine control in ICPs, especially in adults. This is different in children, so just to know that these, these guidelines are for adults and not for children. Um, their guidelines are a little bit different. Um, and then our barbiturate comas, we, we generally don't use at Crudiscia, and they really are just reserved for the super refractory ICP patients. But usually when you reach that point, you can you can with fair confidence say whether or not you think this patient actually has a reasonable um, chance at a good outcome. And we almost never go to a barbiturate coma to, to kind of salvage that situation. As I mentioned before, the only class one evidence in the Brain Trauma Foundation guideline is on steroids. And all you need to know is steroids for head injuries are bad. It doesn't mean that if you've got a patient with septic shock and we kind of use the the septic shock 
doses of um, hydrocortisone of the 56 hourly, um, that those are actually kind of low doses. The steroids levels we're talking here are steroid levels that they specifically try to target with methylprednisolone at very high doses running infusions, which showed um, th th those studies were all actually um, aborted early. Um, because of the significant mortality risk to the patients that were actually in the steroid arm of the, uh, uh, of the randomized controlled trials. So we don't give steroids to manage uh, head injuries and cerebral swelling. Nutrition, this is not dissimilar to most of our other uh, critical care patients. Um, we also aim to achieve full uh, nutritional goals by between day five and day seven. Most of our patients that we admit into the neurocritical care unit are isolated head injuries and they usually don't have issues with their, their guts or bowel or um, gut function. And we can establish almost full feeds within the first 24 hours of them being in, in our unit. Um, just keeping an eye on that phosphate and making sure that they haven't been like underfed for a few days before they came into our unit. Um, prophylactic antibiotics we don't use. Um, uh, that's that's all you need to kind of know there. So there is no no um, scope or use for prophylactic antibiotics for penetrating spine injury or penetrating head injury with open to press skull fractures. We just use the routine surgical prophylactic antibiotics at the time of the the surgery itself, where they get the kefsol, and then we don't continue with antibiotics unless it's clinically indicated. In which case, then we treat. So it's not a it's not a prophylactic regime. Then DVT prophylaxis. <laughs> so I'll say that, so the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines then suggest uh, or recommend uh, that a stable traumatic brain injury patient should have uh, TED stockings and or heparin and clexane running as a chemical prophylaxis. The timing, however, of the chemical pro prophylaxis is widely debatable and depends, it really does depend in the unit that you're in um, uh, what the recommendation will be to start fixing in heparin. Our general rule for our patients with head injuries is we usually wait until about day 10 to 14. We do a repeat scan and, and if there isn't any new bleeds or any enlarge, uh, enlargement of the existing bleeds, then we will start um, uh, clexane for in those patients if they don't have any renal um, dysfunction. Um, but there are units overseas that will start clexane therapy after they've um, scanned the patient to make sure that there aren't any new bleeds uh, and their surgical or their risk of going back to surgery um, acutely or emergently are low. They will start clexane in those patients within 24 hours. Um, the thing is just if, if you are going to do that, you do need to know that the risk of, of developing another intracerebral bleed is not low and you need to have access um, to CT scans very quickly, very easily. Um, and I mean, our CT scan services are already so overburdened Then to try and start clexane early and try and now worry every time a patient has a seizure or deteriorates, may, if it may have been due to the clexane, and you end up scanning these patients unnecessarily four, five, six times a week, um, which our system can't really handle, which is is why we are more towards the conservative um, way when we institute clexane. But all of our patients are on TED stockings uh, and compressive calf devices. Um, seizure prophylaxis, um, the recommendations are still that the patients with significant head injuries with raised intracranial pressure should be on seven days of phenytone, after which time you can then um, uh, individualize for each patient if they haven't shown any evidence of ongoing seizures or they've never had a seizure you can usually stop their anti um, uh, anti uh, epileptic at seven days if they then develop seizures they'll probably have to stay on it for at least six to twelve months um, phenytone is still the recommended or preferred anti-epileptic in trauma um, although there are circumstances where you may want to kind of individualize for each patient, especially the patients with like the large intracerebral contusions in the frontal and temporal lobes where you kind of anticipating that they may have like significant behavioral changes once they wake up and start their rehab process because the epilim or sodium valproate are um, better agents in terms of just helping the frontal lobe dysfunction um, and mood stabilizing effects that you kind of can utilize that phenytoin doesn't offer. Um, uh, Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines for ICP monitoring, we've, we've essentially gone through that, but um, 
if there's a uh, it's indicated in patients between a GCS of three and eight with an abnormal CT scan. Um, uh, and even, you may even have a normal CT scan, but if you've got a low GCS with your age over 40 or you've got motor posturing or hypertension that they define as a systolic blood pressure of under 90, then you should get ICP monitor. And um, their threshold for um, treatment institution for raised ICP is a level uh, is an ICP level of 22 millimeters on mercury. Um, all right, which is uh, more or less what we follow as well. Cerebral perfusion uh, monitoring, they say you should be aiming for cerebral perfusion between 60 and 70, uh, which is also what we do. Um, advanced cerebral monitoring, so Lycox and uh, microdialysis monitoring is actually not recommended by the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines as a, um, a treatment modality that's going to help uh, in terms of mortality benefit for patients. And they are, uh, microdialysis specifically, are more uh, research driven um, to try and see if there are actually markers that we can look at to target um, different treatment strategies. Um, but the BTF doesn't actually support you know, routine placement of Lycox or microdialysis catheters um, in the treatment of traumatic brain injury patients. And then part of the BTF guidelines is also that there are systolic blood pressure ranges, but that to me goes kind of hand in hand with cerebral perfusion pressure. I mean, you may actually have a lower um, systolic blood pressure than what you want or need for a patient, but as long as your cerebral perfusion pressure and your Lycox remains okay, then I wouldn't chase a blood pressure specifically. I wouldn't actually augment that unnecessarily. Um, I've put these slides in just for your own learning. It's just a little bit of a summary for um, hypertonic saline and mannitol. Just a couple of the things that I will mention to you, but you can kind of study this um, by yourself. Um, at Critic Hospital, we've got the 5% hypertonic saline in a 200 ml glass bottle. That's what we've got. And just kind of note that it actually has a lot of sodium in it. So there's 856 milli equivalents um, uh, per liter. So obviously, just remember, we don't give them a liter. Often, we just give them 200 ml that we usually run at a rate between uh, 33 to 50 mils an hour and that that means that you kind of run it in over a four to six hour period for them um, but uh, the one um, big advantage I think that mannitol has so just remember that mannitol is the big glucose mon uh, molecule um, but this you can give as a stat uh, dose and that we usually give at between one to one and a half grams per kg body weight and you can actually repeat a second dose if you need to uh, at about half a gram per kg um, for, for the mannitol. So mannitol is just nice because you don't have to run it through an infusion pump and you can just let it run in like a waterfall. Um, so uh, that I've kind of mentioned now as I was talking. Um, then the evidence on hypertonic saline and mannitol I've mentioned to you now. So there's more and more evidence actually coming out saying that hypertonic saline um, for resuscitating head injury head injured patients are actually superior to mannitol and I suspect that in the new Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines um, it, it'll actually reflect uh, the latest studies on that as well. Um, Anticonvulsants we've gone through, I've kind of just put a picture here for you guys in your studies as well just to know that where the, the different agents act um, and that just remember that the two agents we typically use in a trauma setting is phenytoin and sodium valproate. Um, and we use it, pro so as treatment, we'll use it once a patient has had more than two seizures um, post-trauma, um, whereas prophylactically, we won't wait until the patient seizures if they've got raised ICP, a significant midline shift, or a large mass lesion, because if they, if they have a seizure, these patients may not be able to afford the extra raised ICP spike that comes when you know they have a seizure. So we'll just prophylactically put those patients on uh, on an anti-epileptic. Um, and just to remember, you have to load the patient with both of these agents. Penitone, we typically load 1.2 grams that we write up in a 200 ml normal saline and you have to run it slowly, like over 30 to 60 minutes um, because they do get like a, a, a rebound hypotension from it or they can. 
uh, uh, whereas sodium valproate in a trauma setting, we prefer to also load with an IV and not oral. Um, the nasogastric tube that these patients have in often interferes with the absorption of the, the sodium valproate. So in an ICU setting, we always write up IV and the epilim typically we load one gram um, IV also over about 20 to 30 minutes. Um, so also just some um, notes for you guys that you can study, just uh, summaries on the um, pharmacology of phenytoin and sodium. Um, I've kind of told you how we load these patients and in ICU for phenytoin, we tend to write them up for 100 milligrams um, IV eight hourly, um, whereas the sodium valproate will be anything from 400 to 600 milligrams IV 12 hourly. We do get so, uh, sodium valproate uh, syrup, which is better absorbed and doesn't interact as much with the nasogastric tube as the tablets when they have to be crushed. So if you do have to write them up, if we run out of IV um, sodium valproate, which sometimes does happen, then opt to go for the syrup rather than the tablets that get crushed. Um, so again, in ICU, we also follow the whole principle of uh, sedation and analgo sedation. So often when these patients come in, we have a little bit of a tiered protocol, which we obviously individualize for each patient but we will often start these patients out on a morphine infusion and see if they do need to step up, uh, if that doesn't control them and settle them and they, ha they don't have well-controlled ICPs, only then will we institute a propofol infusion. Um, and we've also moved away from midazolam infusion in the past. We've used it a lot, and it was one of our first tier things to just stick a patient on a midazolam infusion. It's now one of our last agents that we use, and when we use it, we tend to only use it as boluses to settle a patient and not run infusions anymore. Um, and the place then where we would use it then more routinely is in patients with alcohol withdrawal um, uh, or, or seizures, to, to abort seizures. Um, then uh, the surgical side of things, so obviously the treatment of traumatic brain injury, uh, surgery we go to if there's a, a surgical lesion that needs or mass lesion that needs to be evacuated like an extradural hematoma, a subdural or a very large uh, intracerebral hematoma that needs to be drained. Uh, although we tend to not do it that often for intracerebral hematomas. And then obviously the patient goes for a craniotomy, the, the blood clot uh, gets evacuated. If there's a significant depressed skull fracture that actually causes mass effect, which we, we often see, we'll take that patient for a craniectomy, not because of cosmesis, but actually because of the mass effect that the depressed skull fracture has on the brain. Um, and then uh, we've spoken extensively about um, just trying to maintain uh, neuroprotective measures, which will include everything we've just talk talked about now. Um, this is just an example of depressed skull fracture. Um, and I mean, they can, off they can be significant. I mean, we've seen patients that have been assaulted with axes and bricks and the depressed skull fracture actually can have quite significant mass effect. And it's also a sepsis risk. With like a fracture like this, you can almost for surely say that the dura has been breached and torn. And so you take this patient to surgery, not only to clean out and wash out the, the, the fracture site itself, but to actually elevate the fracture and try and see um, how best you can repair the dura because the dura is actually um, quite a significant part of, of brain protection from sepsis. Um, and then as an added bonus, you, you hope to kind of restore some sort of cosmesis to these patients, especially when it's in, a, in an area that's as obvious as the, the frontal lifeless patient scan here. Yeah. Um, just a, a word on base of skull fractures. Just remember that when you do have a patient with um, base of skull fracture, you, you always have to think about CSF leaks, either ongoing um, that can be either through autorrhea or rhinorrhea. Um, and it's also always important to try and see if you can see raccoon signs, battle signs, subconjunctival hemorrhages, which are all kind of um, clues that there's um, basal skull fractures. And the reason why we need to know it is the, the risk that these patients have of developing meningitis. So generally, if there's basal skull fractures or there's penetrating skull injury that goes through the air sinuses, so maxillary, frontal, sphenoid sinuses, mastoid sinuses, we will put these patients routinely on a pneumococcal vaccine, um, just knowing that it'll only afford them protection from community-acquired um, meningitis six weeks after they received uh, the, the vaccine. Um, 
you don't actually physically have to do something about the CSF leak as the patient comes in. The majority of these um, CSF leaks will actually heal and seal up by themselves. But it's just to also know that if these patients then three or four or five days uh, in the ICU stay, start spiking temperature, that if you choose an antibiotic regimen, that you have to choose something that will cover um, uh, a meningitis, uh, whether it be a community acquired, if they start spiking fairly soon on in their stay within the first 48 hours, or it may have to be as broad as meropenem to, um, to kind of cover them for hospital acquired um, meningitis. Um, just the other thing that I want to say is like often in the trauma setting, we aren't in the position where we can actually sample the CSF um, because of ongoing cerebral swelling and raised ICP. So we kind of have to cover them with empiric treatment to cover for a CNS uh, infection. So it, it, it remains a difficulty and we try and um, limit, limit our use of big, big antibiotics. Just a word on uh, an external ventricular drain for, for you guys um, so that you don't get a, a huge fight whenever you have to see a patient with an EVD. It, it literally is a drain that looks not very dissimilar to a CVP, uh, a single lumen CVP. It's, it gets inserted typically, it can go in any CSF space, but when we use it for trauma, we typically try and target the, uh, the frontal horn of the lateral ventricles. Uh, and insert it uh, in a, a frontal position. But now this, this isn't, so the scan, the picture of the scan that I've got in here, I'm just trying to make my point that in a trauma setting, it's not always pragmatic and practical to try and insert an EVD because to try and hit these ventricles with an EVD at two o'clock in the morning, even if you had neuro navigation with you, is a difficult feat. Um, and you may end up with an EVD in the basal ganglia or heaven forbid the midbrain. So these are really not um, easy external ventricular drains to insert. It's not like you've got a patient with hydrocephalus where the drain insertion is, is, is fairly easy. Um, microdialysis you don't really need to know anything about and we'll probably not see it here for a very, very, very long time if ever. Like I said, it's purely experimental and they're trying to, um, it's a little semi-permeable catheter that they insert. They do do it at Red Cross, so for the anesthetists that kind of rotate through there, you will see these little things in the TBI and the TBM patients that are at Red Cross. And it's just to try and sample the extracellular um, fluid um, of the brain and try and look at lactate pyruvate ratios. You can measure glucose pyruvate and glutamate levels uh, itself. And it's just to try and see if they can actually find markers or ratios that can indicate prognosis in patients. And you can also do drug levels. So for the TBM children, the reason why they insert microdialysis catheters are actually to look at drug levels and the difference between uh, serum drug levels and CNS drug levels if you've got a little kitty that you're treating with TB meningitis. So it could be useful for that. But as I said, purely experimental and extremely expensive. So we don't actually see the benefit for our patients in our population as of yet. Um, so recovery after traumatic brain injury varies and it depends very much on the type of injury that you sustained and how well we manage to keep um, your brain oxygenated during the course of the stay. Uh, and we typically measure um, a recovery um, or, uh, in traumatic brain injury on the Glasgow Outcome Score. Uh, and I've put a little picture for you guys here. Uh, and you literally can have a Glasgow Outcome Score from good recovery where you go to pre-morbid, baseline function where you were before uh, and then death obviously being a, a GOS of five but then the the place where you don't want to be is a, a GOS of three or four and uh, you don't want to actually have a patient in a permanent vegetative state or with severe disability after their head injury um, so we, we really do try and uh, that's also why we select out and have quite stringent um, criteria for patients that we actually do accept into our neurocritical care units and we, which patients are the ones that we actually will take for monitors. It's, it's the patients that we are hoping will have in terms of their prognosis either a good recovery or just with moderate disability with maybe some rehab to improve um, and have minor neurological fallout afterwards. Um, and just a word on post-concussion syndrome, patients will, especially the patients with a, a milder head injury, will complain of this the most severely. And I don't know if it's because they, they suffer more from it or if it's just they're, they're well enough to actually notice the subtle changes in, in them. 
the post-concussion syndrome can actually be quite severe and distressing to these patients and it has a cluster of, of symptoms um, including headaches, dizziness, light sensitivity, um, issues with sleeping, appetite changes, fatigue and depression. Um, uh, often what uh, the more higher functioning patients will complain about is their inability to concentrate for long um, periods of time. And um, they actually have to go through quite a lengthy neurocognitive rehab process to try and improve this. And some patients will have this for the rest of their life. Um, and then just like a word on our multidisciplinary team, we actually have an MDT meeting every Wednesday with a, a dedicated neuro-occupational therapist, a speech therapist, physiotherapy, nursing staff, doctors, um, and we discuss, uh, you know, the patients that uh, rec that are recovering from traumatic brain injury to kind of individualize their uh, treatment, uh, their rehab treatment plan, um, and try and find out where the best place for them would be to get rehab as an inpatient or an outpatient, um, or if they need to be transferred to a facility like Western Cape Rehab. Um, and it really does take a whole team and it takes many, many, many months after a head injury for a patient to actually recover um, from a head injury to the point where they, they're going to be at their best again. And that can take up to 18 months for a patient. Um, and that's about it. I do apologize. It's a very long lecture, um, but I've squished a whole lot of information in it. And if there's anybody that has any questions, um, you're very welcome to, uh, to ask me anything.